All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. I'm just going to be waiting a minute or two for some people to get uh, in here with us, and we'll be talking to you real soon. a quick update for those who just joined. We're going to be starting in just about a minute or two while we let more of you uh, enter. So those just joining will be starting in just about one minute. All right, hello everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar, Cloud Bees Jenkins X on Amazon EKS, uh, Accelerate Cloud Native App Development for Kubernetes. A few things to let everyone know up top. Uh, one, we are recording. So for any reason should you need to leave or maybe have a colleague who is unable to join, you will be able to view this later on. Two, we will be able to take questions. So as soon as you think of a question, even if maybe it's one we might answer during the session, please go right ahead and ask. We want to know what you want to know. Uh, beyond that, don't really want to take up too much more of our time, so can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. I'd like to introduce our two speakers for today. Uh, we have James Bland from Amazon, and we have Victor Farsik from CloudBees. And I'd like to get us started by passing right over to our first presenter for today, James. So, uh, James, you want to kick us off? Yep, thank you. So today what I want to do is, uh, here's the table of contents I'd like to cover today. One is, um, I want to go into Amazon's journey and how we actually ended up uh, um, going from monolith to microservices to deliver faster, innovate quicker, and gain a lot of speed. One, I also want to talk about some changes in development that actually that we had to do in order to kind of meet that uh, meet the initiatives of that particular journey. And then, then I want to also present you guys with how you can learn more information on it, because I'm only going to cover like kind of a small sliver of our journey. But then if you want to learn more about kind of like the lessons learned that Amazon went through, then I'll provide some information um, here later in the deck. And also, we're going to cover a CloudBees Jenkins X demo um, that, that uh, Victor is going to do later on within this uh, demonstration. And then we'll have time for Q&A later on. But um, as was mentioned earlier, um, please feel free to put in information into the chat and uh, answer, and then we'll uh, hopefully answer your questions as we go along. So in terms of Amazon's journey, um, so not very different. So this is how things looked, um, kind of like circa 1998. Um, very basic infrastructure, if you look, you know, uh, web tier databases, um, processing and then things going into the remote facilities to kind of uh, to send off books. If you guys remember Amazon early on, we were kind of we were a uh, bookseller, and so uh, this architecture is not very different. Is you know very a very basic architecture, a lot of different bottlenecks, and if you look at it carefully, you'll notice that a lot of problems with um, potentially with scaling. Um, uh, you know, in order to scale this, you could add more web servers, but then your bottleneck becomes the databases. Um, so. Fast forward, so in around 1998, we became, we decided to do a distributed computing manifesto, and that's when we started breaking things down. If you look at, in comparison to the last slide, there's not a whole lot of differences here. Um, we just basically broke up the database here, and part of the reason why we broke up the database here is so we can scale out the web servers, right? So as the, you know, traffic increases, we needed to add more web servers, and then data became the bottleneck. So then we added um, more, Databases, you know, decoupled some of the data in the databases, so then we could add more web servers. 
So this is a little bit better than the, the slide or the architecture that I presented in the last slide, but it's still not very scalable, right? I mean, um, you know, data, you, now we just have three databases um, and a very basic web tier. So we know we needed to improve this. So we set out on kind of like a different, different missions, right? We, want, we knew we wanted to innovate. We wanted to gain some speed wanted some agility and we wanted safety. And so safety, we meant that, uh, hey, when you do a deployment into production, we wanted to make sure that um, if anything breaks or if any uh, bugs were introduced, that we could actually roll back quickly and safely. And so how we kind of gain some of these different, you know, like on our mission is basically we decomposed for agility. We did some cultural and operational shifts. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard before in the past um, about uh, Amazon's two pizza teams. So we kind of broke things out into two pizza teams that kind of helped culturally to break things down. And we created tools and software to help with that delivery of this stuff. So we can get, gain some of the, um, the benefits of innovation, speed, agility, and safety. So to go further, we created these principles. So some of these principles were a, to make, small, um, to make units as small as possible. So then we decided to decouple based on scaling factors and functions, and not functions, sorry. And then each service operates independently. So um, we don't have services that are tied to other services like with, with tight coupling. So um, services can move independently and release at their own pace. And we, decided to do API contracts between services. So then that way services talking to each other can um, uh, use APIs, gather data, and then each, it allows each service to kind of move independently of one another. And so what was the impact to our development team? So like if we look at like a monolithic development life cycle, you have developers, you have a service, and then you have your delivery pipeline, very linear. Um, hard to scale. So one of the first things we noted that we had to do was we actually had to break up our development into different teams. So that's one of the first things we do, but you still end up with um, services as one monolithic service and then a single delivery pipeline. So to even take it one step further, we broke up the services into multiple services, but then you still have the, the impact of having a, uh, a single delivery pipeline. So we decided to break this up into multiple delivery pipelines. And this is ultimately the kind of the design or the overall architecture that kind of led to these huge organizational changes at AWS, which then led to, you know, a better, a better innovation, faster and more agility for the organization. So I just covered a small sliver of kind of like what a, the, the different journey points that uh, Amazon went through over the time to go from um, monolith to microservices. But if you're interested in learning more, then I encourage you to have a look at the Amazon Builders Library. And at the Amazon Builders Library, we have lessons learned that we've gone through in terms of scaling, um, how to get innovation, um, agility, and uh, speed. And there's real world examples there. And a lot of these are in the forms of kind of like, um, not necessarily white papers, a little bit smaller than white papers, but uh, um, kind of like the documents of our lessons learned and our, some of the practices that we've implemented within Amazon to, uh, uh, to increase the speed and agility at which we operate. Uh, another area that you can actually get more information is in our curated workshops that are created by uh, AWS partners at, um, awsworkshops.io, and these have uh, workshops that are created by our different partners that have different themes around modernization and how to modernize. So it's not just necessarily a how-to, but it's also why you want to do um, use certain patterns in order to gain speed and agility. So with all that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Victor over at CloudBees, who's gonna go into a demo. Yes, thank you. Thank you, James, so much. So. I was supposed to prepare slides. I didn't. You can think of me as lazy or whatever else you want. So no slides. Uh, I'm just going to do demo of Janky Sex. And uh, while I'm doing that, I will use the, you know, waiting time to, to explain a couple of concepts, a couple of things. So let's start from the very beginning, right? So actually, the very beginning is what is Janky Sex? It is a 
CICD for Kubernetes of sorts, uh, or we can, I would probably rather describe it as a tool that allows you to manage the full life cycle of your application from the moment you decide to create one until it is running in production and beyond. So let's let, uh, what I'm going to try to do is uh, to simulate, not simulate, to do the full life cycle from the beginning to the end so that you can see the high level, on a high level, true hands on example, uh, the whole process. So I want to start working on a new application. What do I do first? First, I need to create an application. And I'm going to do that by saying JX create uh, oh, sorry, I'm not sharing my screen. Let me share my screen. Nobody's complaining. That's unfortunate. You should see my screen now. So um, I'm going to start creating a new application by saying uh, Jake's create uh, quick start uh, and just answer a couple of simple questions. If it works, maybe it doesn't. We don't know. They must have, have attended. So while we're waiting for this, when you start working on a new application, you need a lot of things, right? One and the most obvious thing you need is the source code of your application, but you already know how to write that. Otherwise you wouldn't be working on an application, but you need to define how you're going to build your application. Are you going to use Makefile or Maven or Gradle or what's or not? Uh, you need to define how you're going to build your container images. You need to define how you're going to package your applications. Uh, you need to define how you're going to uh, create different profiles. So how do you do the same thing locally and in a cluster and so on and so forth. There are a lot of things you need to have to work efficiently uh, on an application. And we're going to do that right now. So I'm going to answer a couple of questions. What is the type of my application? And I'm going to say, yeah, that's Golang uh, because I like Go, but it could be anything else. Uh, who is the user, uh, GitHub user? In this case, GitHub, it could be GitLab. It could be any other Git provider. What is my Git user? And that's this one, uh, which Git, in this case, GitHub organization, I want this project to belong to. I'm going to select, select that one. What will be the name of the repository? I'm going to call it JX Go. It could be anything, right? So I'm just answering some simple questions that anybody should hopefully be able to answer. I'm going to, yes, I want to commit the code. And everything else, everything that is not bare minimum amount of information is being created for me right now. So what is happening is that uh, Jenkins X created a Git repository for me because I need a Git repository to work. It created a webhook so that Git repository notifies my cluster whenever I make a change. We are now already entering into the subject of GitOps and how everything should be in Git and so on and so forth. It created all the files that I need. Uh, and it created many other things. And I can see all that, for example, uh, here you can see that it created a repo for me, brand new Eve repo, and if I open it, and I'm going to do that right away. You can see that here is the repository. Ah, what happened there? Okay, here is the repository that was just created for me. And you know that I'm not lying for a simple reason because you can see uh, that it was created one minute ago, right? So it created the repository. It has absolutely everything I might humanly need or almost everything. I mean, uh, you know, there is always room for improvement all the files are there, everything I need to successfully work on my project. And all, it, all I needed to do is just execute a single command and say, yes, I want to work with this language or this framework. Uh, if I go to settings, uh, if I go to webhooks, I can see that it already registered, not only that it created the repository, not only that it created files and pushed them to the repo, but it also registered the webhook so that my repository notifies my cluster whenever I change something. And this is one of the first lessons, very important. This is GitOps, meaning that you are not supposed to access your clusters. You're not supposed to run random commands. You're not supposed to do anything except write code and push it to Git. And from there on, the system takes over and does whatever needs to be done. And in this context, when I say write code, what I really mean is write something that is machine readable. Now, whether that's Java code, Go code, Python code, whether that's YAML, 
uh, or JSON, that's all code in the sense that it can be interpreted by a machine. So you create something that is interpretable by a machine, you push it to Git, whatever that something is, and let the system take the rest. Your only tool is supposed to be Git and whatever editor you use to write code. Okay, cool. So uh, what did I get? What did I get? Uh, what did I get? Uh, if I go to the newly created uh, directory uh, of the repository that was created for me, if I look at the files, I can see that there is Docker file. That's how we define uh, container images. There is make file. That's how we build Go. If it would be Java, it would be Pom, Pom, Maven, whatever, Gradle, what's or not, doesn't matter. Uh, owners file, let's take a look at the owners. Owners defines who is allowed to review my pull request, who is allowed to approve it. At the moment, it's only me, but it could be other people. Uh, there is also Jenkins XYAML. This is a cool one. This defines the pipeline of my application. And the pipeline is a single line that says, do whatever others are doing with Go applications. That's a that's, uh, free text, uh, free speech ex uh, explanation of that pipeline, a single line. Now, of course, you can extend it. You can add steps that are specific to your project. But as a start, you have a pipeline that does whatever needs to be done. And it's the same like other pipelines for uh, that specific language. What else did we get there? Other paths, everything you need. Uh, actually, one that is important, we got charts. Uh, so this is, um, where is it here? Uh, all the files we need for Helm to package the application and uh, deploy it and do what's or not, right? So that's all cool. Um, I, I, I have a new application, I can work on it. Uh, let me see what else can I do? Um, yes, let's take a look at activities. JX get activities and I'm going to filter uh, the activities for the application. Uh, wait, I need to remove this. Excellent, for the application JX Go. And I can see that the system already did a, did a bunch of things for, for my application. It uh, built uh, the binaries, it uh, built a container, it performed some post build actions, it created a release. The first release of my application is already there. I haven't done anything yet. It created the Helm release as well. It promoted it to to the staging environment because I already configured my cluster in a way that every time I push a change to the master branch of my application, it automatically gets deployed, it doesn't ask me any questions. So that's, that's, uh, that's all good. It's just kind of, uh, and actually, yeah, let me show you that environment when I'm uh, in that subject, get ENV, and you can see that my cluster is configured to have a development environment, that's where builds are happening, that's where tests are running and what's not, and to have staging and production. And staging is set up to auto-promotion, meaning that things are going to be deployed there automatically, no need for me to waste my time on it. And production is manual, meaning that I'm going to make a choice when I want to promote to production. Now you can imagine that there can be many diff different permutations of that same thing, but the point is still the same, you can promote to any environment, namespace, cluster, what's or not, an application automatically or by making a choice. And all that is driven by Git. So I'm just showing you now commands so that you see what's happening in the background, but in what is really going on is that I'm pushing things to Git all the time and nothing else. I'm not doing anything else. And that's kind of cool. So let's take a look at my applications here. JX get applications. Um, come on. And I have two, one called something, which is me trying, making sure that the cluster works before I started this talk. And one called Jags Go, that's the one I created just a few moments ago. And you can see that there is already an application in the cluster. It is running the release, all one, the first release of my application is already there, it's running. Uh, and it is accessible through this address. And I'm going to save this address in a variable, uh, export staging ADDR equals this. And I'm going to send a request to my application just to confirm that it's really working. It's not witchcraft and wizardry. It is working, it's there, it's, up, it's deployed, it's accessible, ingresses were created, load balances were configured, all the magic happened. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Now let's see what would happen if uh, now 
what you saw for by now is how do we start, right? We start is very easy. Now let's see how we develop applications. Uh, and how we develop is I'm going to do what every single developer, no, not the developer, every single engineer in the world is doing more or less the same thing. And that's something is that let's say that I'm going to develop a new feature and what do I do first? I'm not going to use Jenkins X. I'm just going to use the things that you are using all the, already, right? So I'm going to check out a new branch. Dash B, uh, my fancy feature, right? It's a branch. I'm going to work on that branch. Uh, and uh, you, you, you're imagining that I'm developing, right? What do you do next as a developer? You edit some file and you make some changes to source code. I'm going to make changes to this file and say that the output is, uh, what should I say? JX and uh, EKS are awesome. Right. Oh, wait, I forgot the most important part, exclamation marks. Okay, so I developed a new feature or simulated that I developed. What do I do next as a developer? I would add that file. I would commit it to the, to the branch, to the newly created branch. Uh, this is a silly message, right? And I'm going to push it to the master branch, uh, to the new branch. Here you go. I'm pushing it to the new branch. Still not doing anything that everybody is not already doing. Now, uh, that being said, uh, I need to go to the to the repository where I have my application because I'm ready to start the process to deploy my application to uh, production. Right? I'm not going to go straight to production, but that uh, that's the ultimate goal, right? So what do you do next as a developer? Still not using Jenkins X or anything special, right? I'm now in GitHub. I'm going to create a pull request. Everybody does that. We're going to create a pull request and I'm going to leave it. This is not the time to write a long text because this need this webinar needs to end soon. Create a pull request. Right? Now, again, I'm still not doing anything new, anything special. Everything is happening in the background. Everything is magic. And you can see that the first effect there that some process is running in the background is that the system came back to me and says, okay, this pull request is not approved. These are the rules that we agreed should be followed in this company, in this team, whatever it is. And rules, simplified version of the rules is that, okay, if you create a pull request, somebody needs to review it and somebody needs to approve it or close it, right? So I'm using it in a, while I'm doing all this, things are still running in the background. I don't care about those things. I can start communicating with my team. Let's say that I'm now somebody else. I'm changing the persona, right? And I can say, uh, okay, so let's take a look at your changes. Oh, you're, you're a really amazing developer. This is amazing. This is great. But actually, I don't know, like, uh, no, actually change my mind. This is not good enough. Uh, let's close this pull request. And it will interpret my comment. And what it did as interpretation of my comment that it closed it, right? Um, because uh, now we're entering already in the subject of chat ops, how the system should be interpreting your communication with your colleagues and make intelligent choices about what should be done next. Uh, I can say, um, this is not as bad as I thought. I am going to change uh, my mind and I'm going to reopen this pull request and then if you look at the button at the top left, now it's open. Now, while I was doing all that, right? Um, as I said, processes are running in the background and doing the right things, whatever the right things are. And one of those things is that I just got this comment just now. And it says, your pull request is built and it is available in a preview environment. It created a new environment, in this case, new namespace in, in a cluster. Uh, that is unique to this pull request. It deployed my application and I can review it even more. I can go open it and said, oh, this looks awesome. 
right? This is just the change we needed. So I got my application tested, deployed, built, everything I need for it, just, just happening, right? So I'm almost done with this pull request. Let's assume for a moment that this looks correct uh, and that we want to proceed and move it to staging and then maybe promote it to production. What do we do next? We say um, uh, every pull request should have a kitten and then you meow, right? You should never approve a pull request without a kitten. There's a kitten. That's the highlight of this talk, I guess. Anyways, uh, I agree. I'm going to LGTM it. LGTM means it looks good to me, right? And the system says, okay, so you want to approve your, this pull request, excellent. I should merge it, right? Let me refresh the screen. But actually the system says no, right? You cannot approve your pull request. And I'm wanting to do this to show you this so that you see that it's not just blindly executing and interpreting commands uh, and comments and what's or not. It is really also validating, validating them against whichever rules are set. And one of the rules is that I cannot approve my pull request. It looks logical, it looks useful. Now, if this would be live, if you would be sitting in front of me, I would ask one of you to, uh, for your GitHub user, and then I would invite you to approve it for me, but we're going to skip that. I'm going to cheat a bit. I'm going to merge it manually. Okay, so where are we? This is the fastest demo I think I've done so far. What is it? 15 minutes only passed. Brilliant. Uh, so I merge pull request and I'm still not doing anything except changing my code in, on my laptop, pushing it to Git, making pull requests, collaborating through the GitHub in this case, could be some other Git provider. And finally, I approved it. I merged it to the master branch, not doing anything new. Everything new that is being done is happening in a background. So uh, I approved my pull request. Uh, what should happen next? Let's take a look at what's running in staging right now. JX get applications, right? And uh, you can see that still nothing new happened. I still have release all one of my application JX Go. So I need to be patient. I need to figure out what to talk about while things are happening in the background. I can actually give you a sneak peek into what's, what is going to happen. And what is going to happen is that as soon as I merge my code to the master branch, that initiated yet another set of processes, yet another pipeline, which will build my application, test it, and make a release, release all two in this case, uh, automatically incrementing the release number. And eventually it will deploy it to staging. And the reason why it will deploy to staging because I told it that staging is an environment with automatic, automated promotions. Let's see whether that happened. Not yet. Now I'm getting nervous. Let's see the activities, whether it really finished. Maybe it failed. Maybe I don't know how to type. Uh, that's we. Okay, ah, it's still running. It's almost there. It's almost there. You can see here by the this. Okay, let me show you this. This is actually interesting. Um, I, if I open the staging repository, so if I open this repository, this is my uh, repository called something something staging. And what is this repository you, does is that it defines the desired state of an environment, in this case of staging. So nothing is really getting deployed automatically anywhere. What is happening is when I said deploy automatically to staging, Jenkins X interprets that as I should change the definition of the state of that environment in a Git repository and let that trigger a process that will deploy. So everything always starts with a change in a Git repository and that Git repository can be a repository of your application, repository of a, uh, environment of a cluster of a namespace right it doesn't have to be application everything is code and everything starts with a change in a git repository and that can change can be done by you or it can be done by a machine in this case machine made a change and that change if i go to pull requests if i see the closed pull requests and if i go to the last pull request this pull request was done by a machine not by me if i look at the files changed i can see that Jenkins X decided that it should change. What is this? 
that she, it should change the release running in staging from O1 to O2. And that triggered a process that eventually deployed it to staging. Let's see whether that's true. Another try. Come on, come on, come on. Not yet. This is a curious situation when waiting for more than one minute makes me very nervous. While 10 or 15 years ago, I had to wait for three weeks until anything gets anywhere. Uh, come on. Yeah. There we go. Uh, you can see here that right now I'm running release O2. The process finished. I merged my application to the master branch that, in each, that changed the definition of the staging environment. And that definition resulted in an actual state of that environment. So Git is a desired state. Cluster is the actual state. Actual state should converge with desired state always. What else? Uh, okay. Last thing, right? Trying to keep this short so that you can ask as many questions as you have. Uh, so, what is uh, what would be the last step to do? The last. Hey, step Victor, to do can we promote, promote to promotion uh, to production? Can we see that? No, I was about to show that, but now that you ask for it, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> oh man, My you bad. ruined the party. You're going to have to watch me in silence now. I'll mute myself for that. <laughs> no, it's cool. So let's, uh, the last step we would need, right, uh, is to decide, do we want to promote that, to run that in production? Let's say that we had, we're not, let's say, we run some tests in staging, maybe somebody manually checked and we did whatever we need to do in staging and now we're making decision. Yes, I want to run it in production. Excellent. What do you want to run in production? Uh, we're going to, Promote, and that means JX promote. Uh, what do we want to promote? Application called JX Go. What is the version we want to promote? Uh, oh, oh, let's say oh one. Let's say that we are not confident in the latest release. Maybe we want the previous one. Um, and where do we want to promote it? Production. And the last argument is batch mode means don't ask me questions. Now, this command will not deploy anything to production. This is important thing. It will not even touch the production cluster uh, or the namespace. What this command does is it will create a pull request in the repository that defines my production. And then it will validate that everything is right by running a pipeline, a different one. And then it will merge that pull request and that will trigger yet another pipeline and it will be deployed in production. And we can see that here, if I go and open this pull request, uh, let me bring that to the right monitor. There we go. Um, you can see it created a pull request uh, that changed two files. And remember that this pull request is open, right? Uh, now ignore all this because it's formatting issues. What matters is what I'm highlighting. It just, the pull request added this entry to the requirements YAML file saying, okay, whatever you were running in production before, I want to add this application because it was not running there before, right? So it added JX Go, the location of the repository where the, where the package is stored, in this case, Helm chart, and the version we want to run, which is 001. Brilliant, so let's see the, it's still open. At one moment, it will close. Let me go back to terminal and see the activity. Oh no, it's still running. Okay, yeah, there we go. While I was speaking, it just merged my pull request. It could be manual, right? So in this case, I set it to auto. It could be, wait, it could be set to, to wait for somebody to review this pull request. Do I really, really want, want to deploy this to production or what's or not? But in this case, no, no, no manual approvals. It merged that pull request in the production repository or repository that defines production and that initiated yet another process. And uh, let's see, I can, if I look at the activities, I can see that now yet another pipeline is running. This is happening in the background. You don't need to run this. Maybe, let's see. Maybe I made a mistake, uh, production. 
Yes, here it is. It's running over here. This was the pipeline of the pull request. This is now the pipeline of uh, that actually does deploy because it merged. And soon it will be running in production. And we can check that if I go to get applications, right, uh, there we go, it, it already finished. We can see that JXGO is running release all two in staging. This is the address through which I can access it. And it is running release all one in production. And now I use the command JX promote, right? JX promote this and that. You don't have to use a command. The point is in Git always. And I can show you that if I go, for example, to production repository, now I'm not using any commands. If I go to this file, if I go to requirements, and if I change this to, let's say I want to upgrade to version two, right? So I just changed version one to version two. And maybe I want to actually add the second application in production. Maybe I want to add the application that is called, what is the name? Let me see, something, something to production. So I, I just changed this file by changing the version from 1 to 02. And I added a fully new entry called something, which is yet another application, release 001. I want to make sure that you understand that you don't have to use commands. The key aspect here is Git. You're changing something in Git, no matter whether you do it like I did it now through UI, whether you do it from the command line, whether you run a command, whether you do it from Visual Studio Code or any other way you want. Doesn't matter as long as you end up changing something in Git, the rest of the work is done by a machine, right? That's it, that's what you do. You change code, you push to Git. And we can see now that applications in, in production is still all one. Soon this will be upgraded to all two and uh, something will appear in production as well. And while waiting, if I take this address and send a request, you can see this is a response from production. And this is the response from staging, right? Those are different releases because still we are running one release in staging and the other one in production. Soon production will be upgraded and then it will produce the same message. Not yet, one minute approximately. And that was my fastest demo ever. I mean, it's not fastest, I did it faster than that, but uh, very quick introduction. Now time for questions while waiting for my new release to be deployed to production. Anybody? If no questions, I can sing and dance. We'll give this a yeah, minute for some see questions. Yeah, you sing and dance. Oh, there's a new release. There you go. Sorry. Are there any questions? Not currently, but just as a reminder, everyone, you can ask as we go. So. Uh, Please keep them coming. Yes, come to me. You don't want me to sing. Ask questions hey, to save yourself. Victor, I, ha I have a quick question. So the whole point is yes. uh, when, when you modified that environment requirements YAML file, you're effectively mm -hmm. modifying, say, the staging environment, which is using the whole principle, GitOps principle, right? Yeah. So I'm. Um, I'm always modifying the desired state of something, right? right. So Git is my, uh, Git is two things. It is one or the other. It is either the source of truth and then temporarily it becomes a desired state. And I say temporarily because soon afterwards desired state becomes actual state and then it continues being the source of truth, right? But Git is the only, basically, imagine yourself, how would you design this, your all operations, all your processes in a way that nobody ever has access to anything but Git, right? No SSH access to your servers, no kubectl, except in the case of a disaster, right? So Git is the only one who can do stuff, who can, no, sorry, Git cannot do anything. 
that that was not said well. Git is the only one who can notify the cluster that there is something to be done. And whatever it needs to be done is happening inside of the cluster and you are only the person who makes changes to code. Does that answer your question, Oscar? Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, so in those environments, how do I know which environments Jenkins X has and can I add an environment? Thanks, get TNV is the list of environments and uh, it has information like what is the name, whether it is permanent uh, or preview environment, meaning that, you know, when I created a pull request, uh, there was a preview environment, but that was gone because the moment I closed that pull request, that environment was deleted. Why would I waste resources? The namespace where it is running, and this is the repository where that environment is defined. So if I want to know what is the state of production, I would go to open my browser, go to this repository and ignore the files, uh, except in this context, env directory requirements mm -hmm. YAML, and this defines what's, what's the state installed of production. Yep. Yes. Gotcha. I have another uh, person asking a question, actually. I ju I'll just read it out. Um, so you created, I, I think you created a quick start, but what about importing an existing application? Same thing. So if I would go, um, let's see, where am I now? If I go back, if I go to, uh, let's say this one, um, I don't know, some silly application, right? So this is my existing application. Uh, and uh, if I now do JX import, uh, I am, let's do it actually, JX import. Mm -hmm. Task me, okay. Uh, which Git service do you use? GitHub.com, excellent. Who is your user? It's me. And that's your personal GitHub account, just to make sure, right? Yes, that's a personal GitHub account. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, I cannot import this because this already was processed by Jenkins X. Uh, All right. You need to trust me that if you would import an application that is not already in Jenkins X, uh, this command would uh, ask you a couple of questions like what you say, who are you basically? Mm -hmm. And then it would go to that repository and it would figure out what is the programming language? What is the framework, right? It would try to figure out what is this about? And depending on that outcome, right? Is it Node.js, is it Java, is it JavaScript? It would produce all the files that are missing. Like, do you, do you already have Docker file? And the answer is yes, then there's nothing for me to do. No, I'm gonna create it for you. Do you have a Helm chart? Yes, no, right? So it would create all the missing files and uh, in, in the existing repository of an existing application, it would register that repository with Jenkins X and it would create a webhook so that whenever you change something in that repository, that webhook is triggered and notifies the cluster that you want something to change. Yeah, that it's makes basically sense. It's almost I the same. The only difference between Quickstart and Import is that Quickstart creates everything and Import creates things that are missing. Right, the missing files to make it work. Okay, yes. I have another question uh, from Peter Laurent. So you talked about mm -hmm. your cluster and you, you have an existing cluster in this demo, I guess, but uh, mm -hmm. how was the cluster created? That depends on how you like to create cluster. So there are, it's a two step process. One is create cluster and the other one is to set up Jenkins X. Now to create cluster, you can, uh, if you go to uh, one option is uh, if I go to Jenkins IO, if I go to docs, if I go to getting started, then for example, uh, one option is that just follow instructions, which will basically use Terraform to create all the infrastructure you need. This is, okay, let's keep, sorry, AWS, since we are talking about AWS, right? You create this, we created a module in Terraform and you just specify a couple of variables and you let Jenkins X module create the infrastructure you need. That's option number one. Option number two, maybe you don't want to use our module to create the infrastructure, including the cluster, 
You can create cluster any way you want. It does not really matter. Now, once you have Kubernetes cluster, either created through our Terraform module or any other way you like, then uh, you uh, run something called JX boot. Let me show you an example of that. Um, so here, this one, for example, uh, you have a repository that you clone and basically you specify in this file, uh, JX requirements YAML, some things about your cluster. Like uh, you can either go through the wizard and answer a few questions so you can modify this file directly and say, okay, so this will be in this case, GK, EKS, for example, cluster. This is the zone, this is the registry, this is my domain and a couple of things that you can leave them empty and then JenkinsX will not use that something or it will figure out what to do or fill it yourself. Like in this case, for example, I'm telling, uh, for example, yeah, for logs, I want to use this storage. Now, once you fill in uh, this file, you just execute JX boot and the same process is happening like what I showed you before. Something is pushed to the Git. In this case, Git that defines JenkinsX itself. And then JenkinsX uses JenkinsX to apply the, the state that you defined in a Git repo. Uh, and in this case, the file is called jx-requirements.yaml. Now I am old. I often forget what, I'm, what I was asked. And I don't know yeah. whether I answered the question. I forgot even what the question was. I hope I did. Uh, yeah, no, how did you create the cluster? So you did answer the question, but then you rambled on and, and talked about other things. So I'll stop you there. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I have yeah, exactly. one more question so for I, you. Creation of the cluster Terraform or any other way you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, including the, the cloud specific CLIs, right? So EKS control in this case for uh, AWS, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question is, uh, where in the process do we run tests, uh, says, asks Peter. Uh, and these are tests of your application, I assume. That depends on the type of tests. I like to split text tests into two groups, static and dynamic, right? Static tests would be tests that run against your code and usually want to run, some people call it unit tests or right? tests against your code. You want to run it as early as possible. Probably that should be the first thing you do after you check out the code. And that's already also included in the, in the out of the box pipelines. And that there are dynamic tests or whatever functional tests or integration tests, tests that require application to be up and running. And those types of tests, you also inject in the pipeline after the deployment. So for example, uh, when I create a pull request, it is automatically, environment is automatically created and it's deployed temporarily, only as long as pull request exists. And then after that deployment step, you run any, any type of tests you want, uh, if those tests require a live application. And it just, uh, just would be, let me see one example, Jenkinsx build packs, pa, 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 here, here. Okay, packs, Did I, uh, I'm using go, pipeline. This is part of the pipeline, not the full, right? And this is the command that deploys a pull request, for example, and then you would just, what you would do, let me edit this file live right now. Uh, you would do something like sh uh, run functional, test.sh and uh, yep. function. So it looks like we're, right. to answer the question, it looks like some of these tests can be just specified in a shell command on the pipeline uh, YAML file. Everything right? is a command. Yeah, so everything is a command. Uh, there is no other option. It need, needs to be a command. Now, whether, whether that command is a CURL re request or it is a script or a command, it does not matter, it's a shell command. And then you just extend pipelines to do whatever you need them to do that outside of what comes out of the box, right? Makes sense. Now I need to make sure that I don't save this because this is actually production build box report that I have admin rights. So I need to close this.
before I make a mistake. Do we have any other question, Oscar? You're monitoring, right? We do, we right? have one more, oh. and that has to do with, uh, the question is about the existing ingress that's created with your install, but can you use an API gateway? And funny, uh, Peter is asking that because the next webinar covers that, but that's another topic. But I'll let you yes. uh, answer that. Yes, so uh, many of the things come out of the box. Uh, like, for example, uh, Nginx, Ingress, probably a few others. And then uh, every, what, what matters more is that everything is in plain text format and you can, with a slight modification, you can use anything, right? You can change it. So, uh, I don't know, let's say that out of the box, uh, there is, you said gateway. Let's say that out of the box comes Istio gateway and you want to use Linkerd gateway or uh, what is the name? I forgot now. James needs to remind me, AWS, um, I don't remember. Anyway, uh, you just change uh, a single entry in a pipeline or most of the time it's like that. And, uh, and you change the out of the box behavior if that's not what you want. Mm -hmm. Or even better, when you change it and you add something that doesn't exist and you make a pull request to the Pilpax repo, which is community driven open source and all that stuff, so that everybody else can benefit from it. That's the correct process. Yep, makes sense. Yeah, and, and in the upcoming webinar, uh, Peter, who answered the question, will be showing you how to use Ambassador, uh, which is also open source, and, and we'll do some single sign-on against Active Directory to show you how to, how to allow for users to access an application deployed via Jenkins X, which its purpose is to be internal only. So we'll go through that, but yeah. Thank you, Victor. And no other questions. Thank you. No other questions. Okay. I have no idea how long is this webinar supposed to last until the top of the hour or am I already over 45 minutes? No, you, you can go to the top of the hour. Top of the hour, okay. But there are no more questions. I'm gonna give you everybody one minute. Ask me anything. Doesn't have to be related to Jenkins sex. Anything. You have one minute, otherwise we're going to shut this down. Well, you promised you were gonna dance, but we didn't see you dance, so how about you, you actually dance? This is probably the worst dance ever. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know how to do those things. <laughs> Thanks so much, Victor. That's I think, happen. I think uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the one that you look. Okay, saving yeah. me from what? dancing, excellent. <laughs> What about multi-cluster support? Good question. So there are two ways you can do that. One way is change a couple of things because basically multi-cluster is still, uh, the, the major difference is that if, if a webhook from a Git repository notifies cluster A, that's what things are happening. If it notifies cluster B, then it will be in cluster B, right? Or C or D or whichever other cluster. So Git controls, who, where is the information propagated? So it's all about, in, on a high level, about changing where the Git webhook points to, to which cluster or multiple clusters, right? Uh, or which cluster gets notification. Now that's, that's option number one and that works today. You just need to change a couple of things. If you ping me later, I'm going to give you kind of um, uh, more detailed explanation. The option number two is the, to wait for a very, very short period of time um, because we are about to release official multi-cluster support preview for now and GA soon, later, uh, soon afterwards that will give additional features like to be able to, I'm not, I, I don't want to speak much about it because it's still not official, uh, but uh, official support for multi-cluster comes and I know about it simply because I happen to be the one uh, leading the project. That's the, that's the thing I'm working on right now. Actually, right now I'm doing a webinar, but before and after the webinar. Ha. All right. Oh. Find well, me a question uh, I cannot answer. When Helm no 3 more? support will be coming? Or rather, Helm when will Helm 3 support come? Yes, uh, we have some trouble uh, to release it. Some loose ends that we need to tie. Uh, it's coming 
relatively soon. I cannot give the date because we don't really operate in terms of dates, kind of schedule for this date. Uh, we are working on it and it's coming uh, relatively soon. I cannot give a date because we don't have yet. Uh, and when I say coming, it will be, uh, it will be pushed to the community and, uh, and uh, it will continue from there. The, the major problem is that it is, Helm tree is not only Helm tree support, but it is architectural change in the way how many other uh, not so obvious things work uh, in Jenkins X. So it's a bit of a bigger work than, than uh, expected. All right, I think that might tie us up for today. Wrap us up. Uh, Victor, Oscar, James, any of you have anything you want to say before we finish this up? Um, I, this is Oscar. I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. And Victor did a super awesome job as always. Uh, just keep in mind, we have another webinar coming up to show you how to do some authentication with the uh, ambassador and single sign-on. So thanks for joining. Brilliant. James, right. no words from you? Yeah, yeah no words from me. Yeah. Thank okay. you for joining. All right, uh, we got one last question and Victor, you wanna answer it and then say goodbye? Yes, yes, anything. What about, what about deployment scenarios? Oh my, you would need to, that's another webinar. I don't know. I, I don't know what deployment scenarios. What do you mean by deployment scenarios? So let I'm gonna try to make a Blue guess. Green deployment, he says. Okay. So yeah, now. We're okay. Thinking. Yes. Yes. So uh, rolling updates, uh, rolling updates, and other core Kubernetes is there out of the box. Canary deployments are there out of the box. Uh, let, okay, let's, let me show you, let me change to Canaris immediately here, just to show you how easy it is. Where am I now? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Jax go. Okay. I'm going to open. This is fast. Jax. Uh, where is the file? Where is the file? Tem uh, no, uh, it's probably here. Well, it's YAML, right? I'm going to search for Canary. Canary enabled false. Enabled, true. I don't have time to wait, but if I push now this to Git, it would be Canary deployments of this specific application. Now, it can get more complicated with that because I, I would be using in this scenario, just by saying true to enabled, I would be using some default metrics. You might wanna change the metrics that are deciding when to move forward, when to move back, but it is, Canaries are already provided out of the box. You just need to enable them. Uh, and of course, you need to install Prometheus and uh, in this case, Istio, I think. Uh, I'm not sure whether it works uh, out of the box with Linkerd. If it doesn't, it would be a change of a single file uh, to make that work as well. And then there are others, blue-green. Uh, that would be a very long discussion in which I would argue that it's pointless to do blue-green today. It was very useful five years ago, but today it's pointless. And I don't know what else is there. I mean, they're all variations of the same thing. Either there is a big bank deployment, that's, that would be recreate strategy in, in Kubernetes or some form of rolling updates, which could be blue, green, canary, or rolling updates itself, all comes, I mean, not all, few of them come out of the box. And if that's not good enough, then it's a change of a couple of YAML files. All right, thank you very much, Victor. Uh, just so everyone knows, if we didn't get to a question and you have some more, you can either email me, I put my email address in the chat, or you can just reply to your confirmation email you received for this webinar. Uh, but otherwise, we'll be talking to you again real soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.